the most important thing is that women understand that it, you know, this is reflexive. It's not your fault. It's not a choice and it's not consent and don't beat yourself up over it. Welcome to Women Emerging, Reclaiming Our Souls from Sexual Abuse. I'm your host, Misa Hopkins, and I'm delighted today to introduce you to Emma McAdam. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's been working in the field of change and growth since 2004 in settings from wilderness therapy to residential treatment to outpatient therapy. She specializes in treating trauma and anxiety disorders. She makes mental health skills more accessible through her YouTube channel, Therapy in a Nutshell, which is built on the belief that small and simple steps can turn into massive change and growth. I am so thrilled that you're here, Emma. Welcome. Thank you. So good to be here. Tell us a little bit about why this topic is significant to you. When I reached out to you, it was like, yeah, let's do this. So why is it important to you? Yeah, I mean, I work all the time with people who've experienced trauma or people who are experiencing a lot of anxiety in their life. And for so many people, like the whole experience is really confusing to them. They don't know why they're feeling the way they do. And I found that when they learn a few simple skills or they understand the concept of, you know, how our brain works and why we're feeling anxiety, they learn a few skills, then they're able to really unlock a lot of growth and a lot of change and a lot of healing that, you know, if they didn't have access to that information, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, um, you know, be able to, to feel that healing happen. So I just love that changing change process. I love the growth process. And I've, I've worked with so many people who um, are struggling, but then are able to find that hope and healing. So I, I that's like, I get really excited about helping people find that hope and that healing. You know, Emma, I could really see that when I watched your YouTube video about the freeze response. It was so well put together. And I just got, you know, your passion for helping people work through the things and, and those beautiful steps that make a difference. So would you share with our viewers a little bit about what you know about the fight, flight, freeze response and how that contributes to really exacerbating our trauma? Yeah. So one way of like thinking about trauma and long lasting, um, the long lasting impact of trauma is to really understand the fight, flight, freeze response. So to, to do that, we have to understand a little bit about how our brain works. There's three sections in our brain. There's this top part of our brain, which is the thinking part of our brain. And that's where we, you know, plan for the future and think about what's going on. And then the middle part of our brain is the limbic part of our brain or the mammal part of our brain. And that's where all our emotions happen and our reflexes and our instincts. And then the deeper part of our brain, the brainstem, that's just what kind of controls our breathing and our heart rate and the other body systems that we don't really think about. But when our brain perceives a threat, so it sees something or imagines something as being dangerous, it is working not in the thinking part of our brain, but in that limbic system, that mammal part of our brain, and it turns on this really powerful reaction called the fight, flight, or freeze response. And it's going to turn on this physical response. It's going to start pumping out adrenaline and cortisol. It'll change how you breathe. It'll make you breathe short and shallow. Um, it'll make your muscles tense up a little bit. And basically what it's doing is your brain and these instincts, this reflex, is priming your body to survive. So it's turning on this reaction and it's going to size up without you even thinking about it or noticing it. Your brain's going to size up what the danger is and it's going to prepare to react. So this is not something we think about. It's not something we plan or choose to do. It just kicks in without any choice on our part. And if we think of a situation or we, our brain perceives a situation as something that we can defeat, then it's going to turn on fight and we might look angry or we might get mad or we might get into a physical altercation. And if we see that danger as something that we maybe can't fight off, but we, we or faster than or we can escape, then it'll turn on the flight response. And so we'll run away or we'll escape or we'll avoid or we'll even use things like day to day, like distraction to kind of escape what makes us feel nervous or uncomfortable. And when our brain um, perceives that there's no escape and we can't fight it off, it'll turn on this kind of other response, which is called the freeze response, where we'll freeze up. 
And this is actually really effective. Um, it, it's very functional in a lot of situations where we're unable to fight something off or we're unable to, to um, run away or escape. Um, but most people have never really heard about it and they don't know how it applies to them and uh, how it applies to sexual assault. And this is kind of the one thing that I wish like everyone knew about because so many people are impacted by sexual assault. So many people are um, personally affected and a lot of people feel a lot of shame or a lot of guilt around this because every single person that I've worked with, and I, I mean, I've worked with a little bit of a narrow selection, mostly teenagers and mostly females, but everyone I've interacted with, and hundreds, this is hundreds of people who I've done trauma work with, every single one of them has frozen in the situation of assault. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Um, I yeah, every single person? Every single person. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's because our brain is so powerful um, in overriding what we might think or what we might want, because it's going to do everything it can to keep us alive. So everyone I've worked with in the moment of assault, specifically sexual assault, has frozen up in that moment. And it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, I live here in the desert. So, you know, we get little, little rabbits, jackrabbits running around. And if they think, sense you passing by, the, they freeze. That's right. You, you get how primal this really is. It's nothing for any of us to be ashamed of, is it? I mean, it's, it's primal. It's wired in. That's right. That's right. And so many of us, like, I mean, we're strong women. We're like educated and we know things and we, and men too, right? This isn't just something that women do, but um, we're, we're smart, we're educated, we're powerful in our own lives. But when we perceive a threat, our brain turns that on and it really does kick back to this ancient evolutionary response in our brain. And you'll see it very clearly in animals. Yeah. So rabbits, right? They will freeze if they can and it keeps them safe because you can't hardly see them. They blend right in, right? Um, and there's a video on YouTube I love sharing where there's this gazelle and it's getting chased by a cheetah and the cheetah chases it down. So it tries running away at first, it gets caught and the cheetah is holding it down. And then along comes a hyena and the hyena chases off the cheetah. So the hyena and the cheetah fight for a minute and the gazelle looks dead. The gazelle is completely frozen. It looks like it's dead. And while the cheetah is distracted by the hyena, the gazelle just pops up runs off and because it looked dead it froze up it was able to escape with its life right yeah so yeah and they'll see this with all kinds of animals researchers who do studies with animals you know they'll they'll um catch an animal and they'll tag it or something when the animal's ready to go the animal's been released the researcher's no longer holding it in any way the animal will stay frozen for a little bit longer but like even after it could escape and what's going on is, I mean, the brain has kicked on this fight, flight, freeze response, and it turns on what's called tonic immobility, which basically means your muscles freeze up. And um, the, the bird or the polar bear or whatever is unable to move its muscles until the brain decides, okay, I'm actually safe. And then it releases that tonic immobility. It releases that chemical surge. And then the animal is able to walk away without any injury. So that's why in moments of trauma, that experience occurs where you really do feel like you can't move. You that's might right. even it's a, want to, but you can't. Mm -hmm. It's a physical reaction called tonic immobility. You feel like you want to move or you want to scream or you want to fight and your muscles won't respond because the thinking part of your brain isn't in control anymore. It's this deeper limbic part of your brain and it's saying, I'm going to, the brain is taking over and saying, I'm going to save your life by making sure you can't move. You can't do anything that's going to hurt yourself. At this point, I'm in charge. That's right. Yeah. yeah. This is really significant in terms of what we know about the second rape, right? The questions like, why didn't you fight? Why didn't you mm -hmm. scream? Why didn't you? You're really giving us an answer to that. There is a physiological reason that we're right. responding the way that we are. It doesn't mean that something's wrong with us or we should have done something different at all, does it? Absolutely. And that's the message I wish like everyone knew. Men and women, everyone out there, because people do. They look at these, they look at people who've experienced sexual assault or trauma or other experiences and they're like, well, why didn't you? Why did you even allow that to continue? Maybe even multiple times. And it's not 
it's not something we can control at least initially, right? Like our brain takes over and it's just like if someone clapped their hands in front of your face really loudly, could you stop yourself from blinking? Like that's a reflex that we aren't in control of, at least initially, but maybe with a lot of, you know, ninja training, we could develop the ability to override that reflex. But initially, no, most people can't. And especially if it's happening to you and it's unexpected, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I like that you brought up that ninja training. I mean, that's what martial artists do, right? Is right. train new reflexes. So if somebody grabs them from behind by the arm, mm -hmm. right, there's an automatic movement that occurs they That's still right. have to use their judgment in the middle of the movement but there's an automatic reflex that has been programmed in from years often of running kata every day so that's, right. that's a pretty dedicated commitment to make a change like that which can happen but i think what you're sharing is so vital that it is instinctual that it is happening often to you when you're unaware and unprepared, right? That this is going to happen. Is that fair? Am I understanding correctly? That's right. Yeah. I mean, it does. It happens most often when we're caught off guard, um, but it also happens. So our brain is most likely to kick on that instinct when we are in a situation of less power. So if, for example, the classic case of Harvey Weinstein and his, um, the people he abused, he had the power over their career or over their job. And so when someone else has a position of power or authority, we're more likely to kick on that. Our brain is more likely to kick on that freeze response. Um, or if we're smaller or physically less strong than the person assaulting us. So you'll see that a lot more frequently with, you know, with women or people who are in a position of less power because the brain just sizes it up and says, well, faster than we can think, the brain reflexively says, oh, I'm going to save your life by making you freeze. Right. And that is survival. Mm -hmm. Even with Harvey, that's survival because that's work, that's employment, that's taking care of my children, my family, myself. He's in that's control right. of that. He's influencing that. So it's, it, it makes sense that your survival instincts kick in and you respond. Absolutely. So just like our ancestors had to survive by fighting off tigers, we have to survive by keeping our careers, right? That's how we pay for our house and we pay for our food. And our brain, our deep brain, our instinctual evolutionary brain knows that well enough to know that it's going to kick in that response in the, in the face of assault. And I think so many people feel guilt or shame or they feel like it's their, their fault when they, you know, just freezing is not consent not fighting back is not consent. And it's not because, you know, someone was being weak. It's because your brain thought you were in a life-threatening situation. Yeah, it completely makes sense. Completely. Are there people then more prone to that freeze response? I mean, we talked about the three, the fight, the flight, and, and the um, freeze response. Are there people more prone to freeze response? Is there a way to kind of Yeah, so that? in general, um, like I said, people who are in a position of less power, um, or women or people who are smaller. Those are the people mm. who generally your brain is going to kick on that freeze response. Um, the other situation where that might be more likely to happen is someone who has frozen in the past. So our brain, if, if someone froze in the past in a situation, maybe when they were a child and they were smaller, right? And they didn't have power. So when an assault or something dangerous happened and they froze up, their brain learned, hey, I survived that. And I froze, freezing works. So let's do that again. So then your brain will turn on that response much more quickly in, you know, later on. And, and we can retrain our brains. I really believe in neuroplasticity. We can retrain our brains as adults to respond differently than we did as children. But that doesn't mean it's not our first instinct or our first reaction if you know, our brain has learned to do that in the past. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that piece, because that's a significant one. If you've had multiple abuses to understand why you're responding the way that you're responding. Yep. Yep. Your brain, your brain is very keen on keeping you alive. And if you survived the last time, your brain's like, oh, let's do that again. <laughs> smart, smart brain, very smart brain. And that's one thing we can do, right? Instead of shaming ourselves, we can say, thank you, brain, for trying to keep me alive. I appreciate your efforts. I'd like to learn new ways to keep myself alive in the future. Maybe we can retrain together brain. Like let's go do some, some, um, you know, brain retraining to respond differently in situations or to regain our sense of power. 
but thank you, brain, for keeping me alive that time. That's right. And to remember the greater outcome is that you lived through it. And so something was happening that got you there. And part of that was inside of you. I love that perspective. So powerful. Now you've had an experience with freeze response yourself, haven't you? Would you share that story? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So when I was 16, my family moved actually to the West Bank. Um, My dad is a professor. He was doing a sabbatical year. He was helping out with the Arab American universities. So on the West Bank of Israel and um, well, the occupied territories. And um, I was just a little girl. I was 16. I was walking near my apartment, going to get into my apartment. And some man came behind me and swiped his hand up my butt. And I did not know what to do, but my, my instinctual reaction was to turn to him and say, oh, I'm sorry. That was my reaction. <laughs> I apologized like as if my butt had like forced his hand there or something like that. That was my, my reaction. And in hindsight, I was like, what's the matter with me? Like, why did I do that, right? But my brain, faster than I could even think, it sized up that situation. And it said, wow, you don't know the language. You don't know where you are. You're in a scary situation. This guy's bigger than you. Um, and it's like, before I could think, my brain's like, here's what I'll do. I'll freeze and appease. I'll try and make him feel like you're not a threat, leave you alone. And, and so I guess I, I need to thank my brain for keeping me safe in that situation. Um, it, was, it was, you know, a little bit scary, but I survived and everything turned out okay. Um, and later, when I was 22, I went back to Israel and I was um, walking down the street with a couple of friends. And in the meantime, I'd done all this different life training. I'd done a lot of um, work on myself. I'd grown up. I'd gotten older. I'd spent time in two other foreign countries between that. And I'd taken um, some self-defense classes and I took a wilderness first responder class where I trained myself to respond to situations with like a protocol, right? So my, our, my professor was amazing. He would come in there with, he would have someone come running into our classroom with their arm on fire and we would have to be like, you know, like <laughs> react and like think clearly and, and put the thing out. And of course, the first time someone came running into our classroom, what did we do? We froze, right? <laughs> But then he trained us the protocol. You put something on it, right? So then a couple weeks later, someone comes running into the classroom with their arm on fire and we jump up and we put a blanket on it or a jacket on it or whatever, right? Uh, It was like rubbing alcohol or something. It was something that wasn't harmful. Anyway, so in between when I was 16 in the West Bank and this guy assaults me and I'm like, I'm sorry, my butt was in your way of your hand. (laughs) By the time I was 22, I'd gone through all this different training. Um, I'd helped as a facilitator um, for a, like a rape aggression defense course and things like that. I practiced screaming no and I practiced, you know, doing these things. When I'm 22, I'm back in Israel and I'm walking down the street with some friends and these young kids come up and get in our face. Not young, I mean, they're probably 20, they're probably my age. Young men, a couple of them come up and get in the face of me and my friends and they're acting kind of aggressive. And one of them was right in the face of my friend. And instead of freezing up at that point, my brain assessed the situation very quickly. And I knew, um, and, and I reacted by, by hitting the guy in the shoulder and knocked him over. And he um, kind of rolled over, looked up, was kind of embarrassed and kind of scampered off. Um, and, and in that situation, my brain assessed my skills and my ability to react in a way that said, oh, you know what? You can handle this in a way that'll keep you safe in a different way. And um, I think that the training that I had prepared me to respond in a different way in that situation. Now, again, like there's no shame in freezing. Like if that guy had been stronger or if my brain had assessed things differently, I mean, this was not me thinking, this was just pure reaction. But if my brain had assessed him as being more dangerous or if he'd had a gun or if they were bigger or more numerous, my brain probably still would have said, the best thing for you to do is to freeze up, appease them, just be nice just quietly scamper off, do whatever, right? To keep me safe. But because I, because I, I tell this story because I also believe that if we want to respond differently, perhaps to something like sexual harassment in the workplace, we can retrain ourselves to not freeze up and to be more assertive and to keep ourselves safe still um, in, a, in an effective way. But again, if our brain is going to take over and, and keep us safe, I'm going to thank my brain for that. Yeah, I like that. That sense of respecting 
what your brain is doing to keep you alive, to respect that, and then consider whether you want to add some training to that so you have maybe a bigger scope of response or a broader range of response that you might be able to employ in different I, Yeah, I love, mm -hmm. I love how you describe that. Just a broader range of response. Let your brain have more options to choose from when it decides quicker than you can think how you're going to respond to situations. Yeah, beautiful. Emma, what have we not covered today that you really want to make sure that our women know about the freeze response or any of those three fear responses? I think the most important thing is that women understand that it, you know, this is reflective and men too, but this conference is for women, that this is reflective, it's reflexive, it's not your fault, it's not a choice, and it's not consent, and don't beat yourself up over it. Um, the other thing I would want people to know is that sometimes these physical reactions to trauma, they can get trapped in our body if we don't resolve them. So years later, we'll feel those similar effects. We might feel frozen or we might feel that fight or flight reaction, that physical jolt of adrenaline when we're scared or when our brain remembers um, these situations. When we remember something scary, our brain perceives that as an immediate threat. And so our body might go through that fight, flight, freeze reaction just by remembering something that was bad that happened to us. And then our body will have that adrenaline response. And our body has a natural way to work through that fight, flight, freeze response. So it looks like a burning off that adrenaline by shaking, by moving, by crying, by being jittery, um, by feeling the need to um, do something physical. And if we honor our bodies, it has a natural way to resolve that response and to create that movement again. Um, so I, I would say it to people like, you know, work with your body as you try to heal, because I think our body has a deep wisdom as to how to heal these kind of trapped in fight, flight, or freeze responses. And, you know, they can become habitual, uh, but we can also learn, if we learned to do it over and over again, we can learn to do something different and our brain can rewire and we can respond differently if, um, you know, to different types of, of thoughts or emotions. And, you know, we do have an inherent ability to heal. We do. And we do long to heal. It's, it's uh, my friend, Stephanie James, the co-host says, when you cut your finger, you don't sit and worry and fret and say, oh gosh, I really hope this heals. You trust that mm -hmm. your body's inclination is to heal. Yeah. You trust that. And that what I'm hearing is if you listen to your body wisdom, mm -hmm. it's telling you a story and Absolutely. it's pointing toward a way in which you can heal that mm -hmm. physiological response as well as that emotional mental response. So if you have like an inclination to, to freeze up, like maybe when you remember an old memory, you feel tight or tense or like you just want to hide under your covers or, you know, I might have, I, I've had clients in session who will sit there and they'll tell me about some abuse and they'll say, I'm so angry. And while they're telling me about this abuse, they're sitting there like locked up. Right. <laughs> if they pay attention to their body, they're feeling that weight and that heaviness and that locked up. One of the things I tell them is, you know, maybe shake out your arm. Just feel that for a minute. Shake out your arms and legs. Stomp your feet. And if they start tuning into their body, they'll notice that their body has this natural way to resolve that freeze response. And that's often through body movement. And I think sometimes we get really scared of what those physical sensations are. Like anxiety feels uncomfortable, but it's not going to hurt us. And it's not bad. So if we tune in, we listen to that that feeling of, of tension or that feeling of locked upness. And then we work through it with our body. Maybe that includes movement or working with a, a therapist who's trained in working with that, that body response. Then our body has this natural inclination to heal. It can work through all the steps of that fight, flight, freeze response because one of the last steps is resolution. And our body knows how to get there if we listen to it. Then we can work it out of our system. And, you know, if we learned a habitual response, like running away or avoiding, or if we learned a habitual response to fear like freezing, we can also learn a new habit and a new response, which is going through that process and healing and coming out the other end, feeling peaceful. 
So I, that's the thing I would want people to know is that if you feel stuck in this freeze or you feel stuck in anxiety, you can retrain your brain and your body to respond differently and move through it to a point of peace and, and healing. That's so powerful. If you know or you sense that you're being re-triggered over and over again, because that's the sense of helplessness and we get into despondency and despair. But if you know, you recognize the trigger and you honor your body, you can do something about it. You can walk it through, walk yourself through to resolution. That's right. Yeah. Experience healing. Awesome. I love that. You have a gift for everyone. Would you like to talk about the gift? Yeah. So I've created a series of videos to help people um, go through some of this physical grounding. And when I say grounding, I mean kind of returning to center, calming down your nervous system. And this really is the antidote to the fight, flight, freeze response. We, we can't fight off the fight, flight, freeze response using our brain or by thinking. We have to do it kind of through our body. And that's how we communicate with our with our um, our deeper brain. So I've created a series of videos that walk people through this um, fight, flight, freeze response and to um, to get to a more grounded space. So uh, I'm, I'm sharing that with all of your viewers or listeners. I love it. I'm saying this a lot. I love it. <laughs> I love what you're offering. I do. Thank you for that. That's a very generous gift, by the way. This is not a 10-minute kind of video. This is an in-depth series, isn't it, that's taking people through steps that they can follow for their healing. That's right. It's a series of videos. It's about 20 videos. It's a little bit over, um, I think, an hour and a half, if you'd like to watch all of them. But you could watch each one, one at a time. They're a couple minutes each. And by the end of it, um, you know, you'll have 20 new skills to work through that fight, flight, freeze response by listening to your body. Very generous, Emma. Very generous. And of course, we'll have the link posted below the video. And I encourage you to go find her on YouTube. Emma McAdam offers some really great practical advice to help you move through trauma. And I thank you so much, Emma, for your time and your wisdom today. Thank you so much. I really appreciated talking with you. Beautiful. Well, we love you and love the work that you're doing. And we're loving everybody who's here and viewing. I encourage you, go check out Emma's work. We honor you for your journey, your courage, your willingness to heal. With every woman that heals, we are changing the playing field. We are changing consciousness on this planet. So we honor you, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.